U.S. editor for Dezine. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight with some really talented panelists talking about the past, uh, present, and future of Afrofuturism. Uh, this is the second in a series of discussions that we've done with Neuhaus uh, called Building the Future. The first was earlier this year, and um, we're excited to keep these conversations going, um, talking about the future of art, design, um, with talented, talented makers in, in the community. Uh, so we're here tonight to talk about Afrofuturism, which is a really loose bank blanket of terms. As you'll see, it's pretty much, you know, as diverse as the people on the panel and the concerns are, you know, hard to iron down. But it was coined first in the early 90s. Uh, but of course, the considerations go um, back beyond that, uh, you know, to the 60s and, and beyond. Uh, and really, it incorporates so many elements of, you know, the diverse cultures that went into and, you know, came out of the African diaspora. So tonight we're going to do a couple presentations. Um, Fabula, Tarek, and, and Lake here. Uh, we'll just go through those. They're going to talk a little bit about what they do, and then we're going to have a conversation. And at the end, if anyone has any questions, please hold them, and we'll, we'll take them then. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead. You ready? I, I think so. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for coming. All right. Um, thank you. So my name is Fabiola Jean-Louis. This is one of my pieces titled Paradise Lost. This piece and all the other works that I create are my attempt to unpack the black experience. My goal is always to hopefully create something that is visually beautiful, but that also imagines alternate realities. You know, we've, I've, I've had this conversation often about what the definition of Afrofuturism is. And I always say that, you know, I, I don't necessarily think I wouldn't just say that my work fits into this genre of work. By default, because I am a black woman, I am always in a position of having to reimagine or imagine alternate realities. And, and the camera is one tool that I use to help me bring these worlds together. And um, paper is the material that I use to help me sculpt and shape the worlds that I want to create. So these are just it's just a really small example of, of the work that I create and the worlds that I create. But the point of them really is just to give a, a taste of my attempt of unpacking the black experience the best way that, that I can. Currently, my work is expanded to not just photography and working with paper to make dresses that are worn, but now I'm building sets, uh, dioramas, mini sets, and worlds that will help me expand even more on what it means to be a time traveler and a visual activist. So with that, I'll pass on the mic. Hi, my name is Tarek Dixon. I'm the founder of Trunk. We're a New York City-based design studio, cur curator, retailer of contemporary design. Um, I guess the way in which we relate to the topic at hand today is that Beginning in 2020, we started a series of exhibitions that interrogate questions of race and cultural bias within the design community. Um, one of the first of which was called Provenanced. So that was really born out of um, what was launched in 2020 and was born out of a lot of conversations that were happening around the Black Lives Matter movement. And I felt like there was an absence of you know, interrogating the ways in which these same, you know, insidious systems that we were critiquing and like how they actually infiltrate the end products that we create and consume. So one of the problems that we identified was the complete um, erasure of African and indigenous contributions to Western visual, visual language. So this is, uh, because it happened in the midst of the pandemic, we produced a digital exhibition that was all rendered in um, 3D. So I'll just play the video for you.
So with this exhibition, we... Ooh, okay. <laughs> Um, so with the exhibition, we paired contemporary designs alongside vintage African artworks. And I think the visual seamlessness just proves the point that it's kind of indistinguishable. You almost can't even tell the difference. But the interesting part is a lot of the contemporary designs didn't actually um, reference or intentionally reference African works as a point of inspiration. Um, so you know, we were challenging a lot of these designers to interrogate their references more deeply and for us to reinstate those contributions to just this broader language of modernism that, uh, you know, African and indigenous works more or less like, in inspired, so. Um, and then th that led to a second exhibition that we recently launched. So a, a young designer named Evan Jerry, he has a studio called Studio Anansi that's based in Canada. He reached out to us after seeing the digital exhibition and said that he was, you know, questioning a lot of the same prompts and wanted to design a complete new body of work that explored a lot of the same questions that we posed with Provenanced. So his collection specifically focused on African mid-century architecture projects that were launched, um, erected in post-colonial Africa, namely in the Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso. And so he was, in, he was interested in this because these these works were somewhat of a reclamation of this visual language that was appropriated by modernism, but at the same time, obviously like recognizes this reciprocal relationship between the two and how, like it or not, these two cultures are now inextricably linked. So I thought that was really fascinating. So he took that, these sort of like works that were derivative of you know, traditional African aesthetics and then reinvented them and reimagined them into these con this contemporary collection. So, can walk you through. So these are some, this is just a mood board that pulls from some of the sources of inspiration. And this, I'm just gonna quickly click through the collection um, and show you the full body of work. So it, there's um, a table series, a chair, a sofa, um, that pulls from a pretty broad range of, of sources of inspiration. So that was it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so my name is Lake, and I am a visual artist uh, with a background in architecture. So I was trained as an architect. And um, I do like large scale public installations, but also uh, these sort of massive world building projects. And um, they're sort of you know, the, the, the tradition of architectural utopianism through the lens of um, Afrofuturism, uh, Afro-surrealism. Um, and effectively, you know, what that means is that I, I sort of use architecture, its conventions, its typologies, its processes as a medium to explore, I would say, contemporary social, political, economic, environmental issues and kind of project them either into a near or far-flung future or alternate reality. So all of that said, <laughs> for this project here um, is an ongoing series called Shanty Megastructures for Lagos, Nigeria. And so I take the kind of material construction language um, of highly self-organized um, informal settlement slums um, and scale it up to the sort of scale of colossal architecture, um, similar to, you know, uh, large scale office towers, luxury office towers, um, luxury housing. And it's a commentary on how, you know, large scale urban development at best uh, ignores these communities and at worst. Um, bulldozes them and displaces them. And that's not only in Lagos, Nigeria, obviously, it's everywhere where there's gentrification occurring. Uh, Chicago, where my family now lives, is a good example, where they tore down so many of the housing projects, um, displaced hundreds of thousands of community members on uh, you know, downtown, south side, west side. And so, you know, this is uh, about that, but about kind of granting visibility to these marginalized communities and also challenging the notions of 
what a sort of sci-fi and advanced aesthetic might look like. So for this image, a uh, series called the Anarchonauts, it's still connected to shanty megastructures. But I'm going, uh, if, if, if shanty megastructures is the architecture of this new world, Anarchonauts is beginning to look at the interiority, at the community, at the inhabitants, and what it might look like. And so these are a series of mashups of photographs um, that I've taken and my friends have taken throughout uh, Nigeria, South Africa, Mozambique, with um, 3D models of, of what I'm imagining to be the discarded uh, digital detritus, uh, electronic wastes uh, from the excesses of kind of like a post-capitalist society. So you have this amphibious uh, autoponic trawler, right? Um, and that, you know, kind of uh, duplex uh, shack is a, a photograph I take in uh, Mokoko um, in Lagos, Nigeria, which is uh, one of the some slum settlements um, connected to the third main, or the area around the third main land bridge in Lagos. And so you have this here uh, kind of mobile hover farm. Um, and then this woman who has this kind of complex air filtration system uh, that's been built out of, again, you know, um, upcycling, uh, salvaged, um, you know, salvaged electronic waste. And so these last two images I've brought this to um, Brooklyn, where I'm reimagining uh, Brooklyn, where I've lived for the past 22 years. As there's there's a whole narrative behind this. This was exhibited at the moment. It's called the Frozen Neighborhoods. Um, I won't get too deep into it because I think we're sh running low on time. But basically, I imagine what the community, you know, the kind of fall of infrastructure we've seen during the pandemic um, has has revealed. But what happens when the community begins to develop these incredible green technologies um, and really this sort of sustainable system? Um, transforming things like the MTA into now these virtual learning kiosks where you can be in these immersive environments where you can, you know, do everything from job training to, you know, connecting with family overseas. Um, so there you have it. Great. Thank you. So. I, I think we're done with that. <laughs> let's, let's, give, let's give you guys a round of applause just for the presentation. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you. Awesome. So yeah, everyone is doing such different things, and I think that's what makes this such an amazing topic. Um, just kind of going, I guess, in, in a you know kind of a formulaic way. Um, this is a question for Fabiola, and and maybe Tarek, you can. I think everyone can contribute to this, but you know, when you think about Afrofuturism, you really think about a kind of a hodgepodge of future, and um, but you do also reference the past when you talk about time traveling. Um, you know, and obviously just looking at, you know, the, there is a futuristic element to being able to move back in the past, to use technologies to sort of have a blanket view of everything. Why is it so important to, to make sure that we're taking some of these influences from these alternate depictions of the past? So I'm a firm believer that in order to know where we're going as not only peop people and human beings, but as a society, um, we need to know where we come from. We need to look back on the past, on history, um, to learn, to inform. And also because, to me, time is not linear. You know, the past, the present, and the future, they kind of can fold in on, on each other, if you will, um, and are a lot of time, well, in my belief, happening all at the same time, right? So you can't really do, for me, I can't do anything without referencing everything um, in time, the past, the present, and the future. Um, and finally, I think that Afrofuturism as a, as a label, um, I think is a wonderful thing to have as far as being able to, to, to look at um, the black contribution um, in a way that in, includes the diaspora, right? But I also find that it's limiting um, in the sense that um, we really think that Afrofuturism means just the future, and we think that it's just sci-fi, just fantasy, and it's not. It's, it's, it's everything. It's, it's contribution across the spectrum, and I think that if... 
I think that it's important for us to have this conversation that we're having today so that we can try to expand on what it means to be Afrofuturistic and then to also understand and learn that it encompasses many different things um, and many different contributions within the diaspora. Did you guys want to speak on that at all? <clears throat> Yeah, I can touch on that a little bit too. I, you know, specifically with Provenance, the exhibition was intended to reinstate history that was erased, right? So rewriting history from the way we know it and have learned it, you know, academically. Um, and so that's like one just like minor example, but then you can look more broadly at this need of like going back in time, looking at history and seeking to revise it, but just the black American experience is, you know, been completely divorced from our own histories, right? It was um, beyond this one example of like erasing our contributions to modernism. A lot of us feel completely detached from you know, our ancestry. And so a big part of the Af Afrofuturism project is, is, yeah, looking to the past and kind of searching for identity in many ways and then using the black diasporic experience to reinvent and reimagine a future. Reimagine a future in which, you know, black culture is celebrated, in which it's paradigm, in which we're self-actualized, where we no longer feel this like disconnect from our own ancestry and history because we've reinvented it. We've created something new for ourselves. Um, and it exists beyond the white gaze. So I do think like referencing the past, interrogating the past is essential to this, you know, project of looking forward. And and it it probably it likely is the impetus for why Afrofuturism even exists. Is is that erasure? So, yeah, because I remember there was a documentary in the '90s, "The Last Angel of History," and it talks about the musicians. Some of the music, musicians, uh, you know, George Clinton was one of them who was who was here the other night, um, and he was saying that you know George Clinton said you know didn't really even know about some of the other people who were doing the same things, right? But just kind of through these conditions, these these. Um, you know, these people came to the same conclusions and same aesthetic forms, mixing and, and reclaiming history through these, you know, speculative, very technologically laden means. Um, you know, and I think that you three all are come from very different backgrounds as far as your, your training. Um, so I, I guess, would you want to speak a bit more about some of what some of these impetuses are that, that kind of, you know, bring this, these collections of works together uh, in a way that, that, you know, we could even maybe even describe them in, for, you know, under the panel of Afrofuturism? Yeah, you know, to Fabiola's point, um, and particularly, you know, my, my father's Nigerian. I was born in Nigeria, and I'm Yoruba, and so we believe that time is cyclical, right? It is always this cyclical thing, and so, um, you know, and, and also just from being, uh, you know, black and part of the diaspora, and we were having the conversation earlier about how particularly, you know, those who were brought to the Americas and enslaved, every single thing that we have produced and created has been a new thing because there just simply wasn't a precedent for it. And we had to draw on our past and our traditions, but absolutely from the music to the food to the clothing to even systems of behavior and mannerisms and everything in education, it was all completely new. So there's probably no one more fundamentally <laughs> futuristic in terms of not having, you know, like actually building something new than, than, than those who are a part of the, you know, the uh, African diaspora. And so, you know, the reason why I say that, uh, or I, I let people know that Afrofuturism is kind of just an entree into my work, but it's not the defining and fully encompassing way I'd art articulate it is because um, again, sometimes I'm thinking of these things in terms of alternate realities. Sometimes I'm thinking of these things in terms of a kind of unbroken chain, a continuation of our history, right? Just kind of, the, kind of a moment in this sort of like continuous cycle through which all of us are kind of evolving and moving through and drawing from, um, you know, the past and the present um, and, and also, you know, as, as I said, you know, that, that my kind of speculative world building focuses a lot on contemporary issues and either exacerbating them um, or resolving them in tenuous ways. And, and, and that's because obviously, you know, we live in America, we see what happens when you willfully turn a blind eye to, 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 to our history or 
or, or you try and sanitize our history or outright lie about our history or outright ban our history or separate our history, right? To say that there is American history, then there's black history, you know what I mean? When, when they're inextricably connected, right? So um, to think just of the future and, 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 and to not consider all of the kind of intangibles, intangible things that weave through all of it to produce it um, is, 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 I think, like kind of a grave mistake. Um, and lastly, to the point of, of science fiction, um, how I challenge sci-fi through my particular work is that, you know, a lot of Western advanced sci-fi is clean, sterile, and oftentimes uh, sort of devoid of culture, the kind of cultural permutations, right? Um, um, a lot of Western sci-fi is very kind of like homogenized, right? So I like to, you know, weave in things that are deeply important to the community um, and its relationship to architecture, the environments, um, all of these things as, as, as other ways of, of identifying like advancement and not just the slick gadgetry or the accoutrements that like signify advancement, right? Which is what a lot of um, the sort of prevailing Western sci-fi tends to do. I'd like to add something to that. Um, I think it's, it's also important um, to create the work of, of, you know, collaging, I think is what you called it, um, these different times, because especially when we're talking about Afrofuturism, we're not a monolithic group of people, right? And there's this constant assumption that the black experience is the same across the board, and it's not. If you speak to uh, Caribbean blacks, they're gonna be very different to European blacks. They're gonna be very different to um, African blacks and African American blacks. I mean, we are going to have this like, my sister, my brother, I understand you type of thing that only we understand, right? But we're, we're not all the same. And so I find that what I'm trying to do with my work is piece together what I call the mosaic of blackness, right? So looking at all the pieces, it's probably gonna require more than one lifetime, right? But trying to find all the different pieces that, that make us what we are. And then, and then beyond, beyond race, you know, beyond race and culture and skin color, um, humanity. Uh, I think also what I'm always trying to do in my work is is get past the, that space of of color, as much as it's very very important in how it in, informs my work. I'm also um, working to dig deeper to the spiritu spirituality place because I am Haitian. I was born in, in Haiti, and um, spirituality is extremely important to me in my work. Um, and then just to piggyback off of what was being said before, um, this the technology and sci-fi Afrofuturism, you know, there's this idea that if you can afford or have access to all of the technology, then you are a part of that science world, right? The tech world. Um, and I beg to differ. I think that um, these communities, black communities, have been um, ignored for so long because we've had to actually create things out of nothing. You know, like in Haiti, they have toys that are made out of nails and, and trash and things that nobody cares for, but um, they function, they do things in, in, in our society. Um, so I think, I think it's, my point about that is that it's, it's important to look at what science really is and is it, is it about the you know the access to technology? Is it is it about um, you know having the the best technology within your world, or is it the ability to create something out of necessity, which people have been doing for a very long time? Amazing. Did you want to say anything? Um, did, did you have anything to, to add um, to that, or? Or maybe you want to talk about how you know you were bringing together. Also, you mentioned before that there were, there are past and contemporary pieces in your collection, and that oftentimes you've set up the practice so that the, there the distinction is is not super visible. Um, 
is there a certain way that you go about achieving that? Like, how do you kind of reach that that synthesis just on this topic of, of collaging and, and circular time and and um, the erasure of these these concepts? For I mean, for the Provenance exhibition, I just think it was somewhat inevitable, right? It was because the influence of African works to modernism and Western visual language was so pervasive that, and it's it completely changed how the Western world thought about form and you know, geometry, that all of these contemporary works, whether it was intentional or direct, reference, you know, these cultures. And in a lot of, a lot of the cases, I had to actively, like, challenge them on their points of reference and, um, you know, highlight the ways in which their work was heavily influenced by, by African and indigenous cultures. It was funny because a lot of people, a lot of the artists would willingly... Um, reference like Brancusi or like Mogdigliani. I was like, but hello, like, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, the relationship was so apparent and distinctive to me personally, but um, seemingly less apparent to a lot of, um, you know, Western European white designers. And I think part of that is it, a little bit is like unpacking a bit of a pathology, right? Of like a refusal to admit these uh, these relationships, like an unwillingness to do it. And I think we do have to be provoked and prodded in that way in order to recognize and challenge the history that we've been taught or these assumptions that we've made and these impulses that we just kind of like lean into. So for me, I thought just putting them alongside, I was like, you can see for yourself. Like, I don't even have to say anything. And you know, the video spoke for itself. Like you can't tell which ones are contemporary and which ones are vintage, yet um, the, none of the vintage works have any provenance, right? If you, like African works when they were extracted from Europe were just treated as sort of like little ethnographic trinkets and like littered all across Europe and it wasn't until it, you know, Picasso got his hands on a fang mask that all of a sudden there's this new ascribed value to it. But even the value of these particular works was, like the monetary value was based on its legacy of white ownership. Right, because there's no no provenance was given to any of these works, and instead, um, you know, historians fabricated these sort of imagined histories of and assumptions imposed upon these works of like anti individualism within these cultures, or you know, can easily just relegate them to craft and not you know fine art. So. Yeah, all of it is about sort of unpacking these legacies and hopefully starting to build a new canon of African inspired work that can exist outside of this, you know, legacy of colonialism. So um, I don't even know what, what the question was originally, but I'm <laughs> sort of rambling at this point, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to add to, yeah, like to, to your point, particularly like the pathology, there, there's this like belief that's part of the like prevailing narrative that that African uh, across the the entire continent is, was not capable of abstraction, but you had very sculptural abstract works that coexisted with highly detailed figurative bronzes and those things, right? So there really is no logical explanation for that kind of disconnect, which is why the entire uh, history of of modernism, both architecture and art, is is extended to those like Picasso and you know, others of the Bauhaus movement and such. And there is, you know, that very loose connection to the Fang mask that, you know, um, Picasso looked at. But there's so much more throughout, you know, uh, that that is abstraction. That, and, and so it comes into the work we're doing now where it's like, it, it's sometimes it's representative, but it, it, it can be highly surreal as well, you know, but there's still that, the kind of denial that we're capable of doing these kinds of works, right? That that could be whimsical, that could be, you know, invent, you know. And conceptual, Exactly, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Highly conceptual or what have you. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, going back to this idea of time, whether or not it's linear, all of these works, these African and indigenous works that Europeans were getting their hands on were contemporary works, yet they were all deemed primitive. So like time made, you know, and you can unpack that. We're, we, we were still calling these artworks primitive up until like maybe 20 years ago at best. I mean, people still do, or they have other misnomers like tribal, but they were called primitive even though they're contemporary. And it didn't matter, you know, at what point in history when they were actually created, they were deemed by Europeans as, as primitive. And so you can, there's 
we could go on for days about unpacking they that. Were modern, the choice of right? language. They were modern, yeah. They were contemporary works being produced alongside at the same time of Picasso and Modigliani and Giacometti. Yet, you know, the choice of language is, you know, obviously very intentional and and layered. So farther back, right? Like for the whole of colonialism, the works were responding to this global, like expanding world, right? There wasn't this like timeless stasis. It's always in. Yeah, because the works were even changing as the European market developed because they were like, they, Europeans wanted like a neutral palette, just like, you know, raw wood tones. So like works that were previously colorful started being produced in just like, you know, unfinished tones. So it was, it was responding to what was happening in the, in the market and Regardless, it doesn't really matter. Even you go into the wing of the Met Museum today, it's all kind of like lumped together. Um, time is sort of secondary, right? And there, I, there's definitely uh, there's definitely a notion of cultural primitiveness that is being imposed. Like that's the point that's obviously being made um, and sort of being made slyly, so. Um, all right, yeah, I think that that's, you know, that's a, coming back to just these points of connections, but also really challenging, you know, modernism. But I think, too, just I've heard from all of you just with the technologies and, and the, 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 the methods and that there is, you know, a way to use science fiction and, and modernism as, as sort of, a, you know, a point of connection and understanding, right? You're saying that there's a bunch of different um, people come from very different places, right? But some of these themes like alternate realities and and some things that have been developed in like the last 60 years are really maybe sort of a shared language, I think, for people across the globe. Um, so with, with your work, uh, you know, is there, are there these points of alternate reality that we can use to try to understand um, some of the, the grander points you're making and kind of, and, and dig deeper into the, into the pasts of, of the objects to, to these clues and, and revelations that we should be having? Um, absolutely. Um, in my work, I touch, so my, I'm more well known for rewriting history, which is um, a body of work that I created um, to make period dresses out of paper and place them on black women and photograph them in these very Baroque settings. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a juxtaposition of um, what was the brutality that we know existed, um, and then the what if, the imagining of what is possible um, when we when we look at the alternative to that to that trauma, and um, so in that work, I got a lot of people asking me like, why are you why are you presenting the why did you choose to present the the black experience through this European lens? Um, it, <laughs> hello, I was born in Haiti, <laughs> right? So my, my culture, my country, the history of my country is very much tied to Europe. Um, most of the Caribbean is, um, even this country is. So I think it's really important to, to put people on blast, you know? And that's what I was really trying to do. It's not to um, bow down to say this is, you know, I honor this, and this is the, you know, this is like the best way that I could have told the story. But I was really looking to talk about brutality, um, and trying to use uh, the idea of beauty as a vehicle to carry ugly truths. Um, and I, I attempted to do that through the the baroque beautiful dress on the black form on the black body. Um, and then with atonement, which is um, this image here, I'm using paper to, um, to now critique um, Catholicism and, and make statements about that. I also, because of my Haitian culture, um, you know, Catholicism is a very big uh, part of, of, of Haiti. Uh, whether you we're talking about voodoo and how it is intertwined with voodoo and separately from that. And so, and I went to Catholic school for too long, <laughs> um, where I, I literally had to decide to separate, try to separate my blackness, my identity from this very Eurocentric um, uh, religion. And I had a hard time doing it. And so, 
you know, my work, it shows up that way because I'm, I'm, I'm hitting on these things that are very much a part of the, the black experience. Um, and then, you know, kind of, again, because time is not linear, I'm kind of bouncing around time, trying to say, what can I find within this space that digs a little bit deeper into that black experience, right? Um, whether it's European um, slavery, religion, Catholicism, or what have you, what can I do to get a little bit deeper into understanding the history of my people, um, just so that I'm better informed? Um, so yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, I think we have time for one more. And <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, I think that yeah, uh, it was great. It's been all been great. I uh, you know should just keep clapping. Um, but I, I will I will ask one more question. I think, and I, I just wanted to kind of springboard off your focus on tension maybe to ask you like a question about, um, I've heard you talk before about the importance of sort of conceptualizing impossible worlds, but for me like impossible is less like can't do it, but like won't do it, you know, like it's, you know, kind of pushing us. So maybe, and then of course, you know, you're pushing towards this idea of black utopia, like in that, in that trajectory. Would you be able to elaborate just on, on how your practice kind of helps us see that? Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. All right. So they're, they're, they're kind of, several things that I'm doing at once when I'm doing this kind of speculative world building, right? Um, the first, as I mentioned, is a critique of the material uh, realities and conditions and infrastructures that we live under. Um, and then the second is just as our reality, <laughs> the material conditions we live under, how they have really forced us to be highly inventive, highly creative, you know, um, as a function of necessity, but also as a function of genuine ingenuity, um, what we produce out of those conditions. So that's where my worlds end up being um, utopian. But they're not always utopian. I'm, I'm continuing to, um, you know, like I revisit my works and I go back through and I think through them. Um, and, and as I talk about them, continue to talk about them. The way I speak about them, it changes, you know. Uh, shanty megastructures, I was calling that a dystopian world for a very long time until I gave a talk at like UC Riverside in 2016. And it was like, no, this is very utopian. This is this, this is this. And I hadn't even heard of solar punk at the time, which is, which is a subgenre of science fiction that is about like green technologies, right? And the relationship between architecture, technology, and environment. I had never heard of the term. So now solar punk is the way I speak about my work. Um, to your question of people asking you, to your statement about people asking you, you know, why are you producing work through this kind of European ideal, right? And your response to that. Well, when I showed Shanty Megastructures in Lagos, Nigeria, um, I, I gave a talk to, uh, architecture students at Unilag, and um, one student got up, this woman, and she just completely eviscerated me. She was like, why are you creating terrible ruin porn for the consumption of Western media and making this stuff look so bad? And she was so livid that she was literally shaking. <laughs> she was so mad. And then after she asked that question, the entire student, you know, the entire class erupted in like a standing ovation, right? So now all of a sudden I'm like, okay, we're getting into it, you know? Um, and, and so, but then fortunately, you know, I, I, I tried to answer the question and again, um, explain that, you know, for me, architecture is a medium. I come out of an architectural education and a practice and I'm aware that the broader uh, uh, concept of architecture and public imagination is that it solves problems. Right, but I make sometimes architecture that's not good, <laughs> you know, that's not livable, that, that's, that's about more than the idea that architecture can, can solve society's ills, when architecture is just another institution and, and actually in, incredibly embedded in the kind of most repressive aspects of structural racism, you know, uh, 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 possible, you know? Architecture is, is, is at the behest of, of the real estate development complex. 
architects designed to maximize dollar per uh, square footage, you know? So out the gate, and this is the education that we're taught, you know, as architecture students in the West. Simultaneously, we're also taught sometimes very well-meaning, a very paternalized, patronizing, oh, we can go into these communities and we can build YMCAs and we can go to Africa and we can build schools and we can build, you know, uh, health, health uh, you know, hospitals and we can fix these problems. And, and that's very good. Yeah, th those projects, they do do a lot of good, but we have to be careful because, again, if you're building these things in, in communities and, and you don't have the connection to the community, to the systems to maintain your work, you see what happens to the architecture. We saw all the well-meaning projects uh, that occurred in, you know, New Orleans right after Katrina that were unable to be maintained, you know? So I kind of said, listen, so, so, so I'm, I'm working through the speculative architecture as, as kind of a way of, of getting into this particular discourse. Um, and fortunately, another student jumped up and said, why do you think this is ugly architecture? He's like, for me, this uses local materials, organic, material, you know what I mean, more connected. And, and the student also said, you know, all of us here, you know, we're, we're born and raised in Lagos, and this guy here hasn't been back to Nigeria in like 30 years, but none of us have ever visited, you know, Makoko, you know, a village, the slum, even though we grew up two miles away from it. So he was like, we have to interrogate ourselves why we're, you know, so he kind of like, Gave me a little, <laughs> gave me a little, gave me a little window to step out through, right? And then so his comment got like half applause, but then it really did generate a very heated conversation. So that's why I talk about it being a cyclical thing, because even in my own work and where I present my work and what the venue is and who the audience is shapes the way I think about it, shapes the way I continue to think about it, shapes the way I develop it. You know what I mean? Um, and you know that one woman's comment about you know uh, uh, ruin point. It was a very very good comment. It'd be presumptuous of me to create works that connect to you know um, uh, certain communities and think that I can just do you know what I mean. Like I have to think of of kind of what I'm doing and 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 who the work is is speaking to right and what exactly it's saying. So you know that really ties into you know it's 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 not just you do cool sci-fi works and you leave it alone and it's just out there. You know what I mean? It's a constant uh, evaluation and re-evaluation of these kind of works um, that I think is very important. I was going to piggyback on that because um, that same critique entered the mainstream too, you know, through popular media depictions of Afrofuturism, namely, say, Black Panther or like Black is King. And I was kind of reading up and trying to under better understand what the public discourse was about, but it was... You know, some people made the argument that the tropes that define Afrofuturism sort of are reductive and bring us back to like this global depiction of African culture being sort of underdeveloped, um, so in quote unquote like tribal. And I was I was sort of perplexed by it too that the argument that was being made and the offense that was being taken, and it, it similarly it's sort of like well the point was being made of, well, Africa is super developed and there's, you know, there's, there's also capitalism in, in Africa and we should be like showing that depiction too. And it's, I, I was like, is, is that the, what, you know, we want, uh, okay. But, you know, this critique is out there and it exists and it's becoming more popularized. So I find that interesting as well. And one of the other main critiques is also like, why, is, why are we treating this as one big monolith? Is it like productive to even have this blanket term of African, you know, Afrofuturism or Black diaspora, and I feel like I mean that's a whole separate conversation. But um, again, I, I, no, we're not a monolith. We don't have a singular experience. But for me, I think of it as just it's a process. It's a process of yes, looking to the past, trying to reclaim elements of history, trying to form and find identity, and ultimately, this Black utopia that we're all pursuing is about self-actualization. It's about feeling empowered. It's about having agency. It's about creating our own futures. And I, I think it's, yeah, and, you know, we've critiqued this process in the past of, you know, looking to, like, black Americans specifically looking to Africa for identity and it being done somewhat clumsily, whether it's, like, through the advent of Kwanzaa or adopting, like, 
Swahili as the the one language that we chose as like the Black American connection to African culture. Um, but I, you know, I th that's the the point is that it is it's a it's an iterative process, and it may be a little bit clumsy, and our paths will diverge and then maybe converge, but um, and we're all exploring it in different ways with different mediums and very different points of view, but that, that end goal, I think, is all the same. And it is about self-actualization. It is about creating that utopia. It's about imagining a future where we feel empowered, so. Amazing, yeah. Uh, if you wanted to add anything to that, feel free. If not, I think we'll probably take some questions if you have time. Uh, I think it was, it was a pretty like, succinct, like, kind of tied it up. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Let's do it. Yeah, we have a couple, uh, time for a couple questions. Uh, there's a hand up in the back that, that shot up. Uh, we'll start there. The, the first question was, in your imagined pasts, I was wondering if um, you felt like sometimes you discovered actual past. Um, uh, have you thought about doing the opposite in the Western tradition, kind of de-individualizing Western art and uh, seeing things through that lens? Great questions. <laughs> um, so, Yes, I have. I have come. I have. Un, I have come across um, actual um, past um, histories that I did not know even existed. Um, even though I, I, I'm not there yet to call myself a scholar um, because you know I don't know. I don't know that I, I totally fit into that in that space. But I feel like the the research that I do in my work brings me closer to that because there's so much that I didn't learn growing up that were not in our textbooks. Um, and it, it surprises me every time, it outrages me every time. It just, it, it's inspiring every time because it's like, you know, someone's like, how do, you, how do you keep going with your material, with your work? I'm like, just open up a history book. There's so much to reference, right? There's so, there's so much there that we didn't know, and there's there's also nuances to things too, um, and so yeah, my my work is is definitely taking me into places that that I I never knew were real. Yeah, to answer your question about de-individualizing Western art and design work, I mean it's something that I do personally because I see it in the market. You see like. A visual language is developed by an artist, it's replicated, it becomes a quote-unquote movement, and then you just repeat it, turn it out for capitalism, right? You make more and more of the same thing. It's like the same idea being replicated. To me, I, in my head, like, yeah, it's de-individualized, but <laughs> is that being um, recognized by the rest of the market? Probably not. You know, within design, I, I've challenged this question of, like, quote-unquote collectible art. Like, what does that even mean? Like, have we even defined what that means? And usually all it means is that um, the right institution has deemed it as such. Right, there's no actually qualitative definition for what we call collectible. It's not even like the market hasn't even proved that there's a demand for it yet, and we're calling it collectible. So, like, I, I do bring up those conversations, but I, I mean, I don't necessarily see that being dismantled by and large for, you know, Western art because that is what drives the market. So, um, but yeah, personally, I, I, I do it. <laughs> And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much sure that I kind of wrestle with the idea of the beautification of poverty, or maybe, you know, hearing it, hearing it now might be synonymous with the way I've been thinking about it. Um, I am aware of kind of the phrase and the term in ruin porn, um, particularly as it applies to privileged individuals going into spaces like Detroit, for instance, and, you know, buying a warehouse for $3,000 and starting an artist collective when you have no connection to the community there. Um, but for me, it's, it's more about um, kind of confronting my relationship to architecture um, and, you know, my personal trajectory navigating a kind of art world. And so it's, 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 it's more about, um, in a sense, like, trying to justify the work that I do without being defensive about it, you know what I mean? But, but really, I, I, I do face this criticism constantly as an architect. Um, as saying I'm an architect, saying I'm coming from an architectural background, I constantly face the, the kind of 
criticism and misunderstanding of whether the works that I'm producing are actually supposed to be built and lived in, right? Um, and, and, and it's so funny because I often have to really, you know, which is why I've, I've started using the term architecture as a medium, because I have to, in a sense, remind people that, like, I'm an author, right? And I always use Octavia Butler, who is incredibly influential to me um, in a lot of my works. And it's like asking Octavia Butler, why do you write such incredibly dark and violent you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> uh, uh, works, right? You know, like, why don't you write grocery store romance novels? And not to, com <laughs> right? And like, not to compare myself to Octavia Butler, but that's pretty much the same question people are asking me. And also, not to kind of recuse myself from like, you know, being able to hear criticism, right? But really, I'm I'm telling a kind of story uh, that I like to tell, and I use Octavia Butler because. You know, people for, people may not forget, but if you read her, she's incredibly violent. Not like a little bit violent. <laughs> like the worst racial, racial, sexual violence, you know, you know, infrastructural violence you can imagine are in like all of her works, right? She's really doing it like that. Um, so if, you know, so I say if I'm, you know, kind of, uh, 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 working through ideas through this kind of dystopian narrative using architecture, um, I'm, 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 I'm more combating, um, you know, those presumptions about architecture and less about the beautification of poverty. And, and I do have to be aware because I do like, you know, collaging things. I do like the kind of salvage, steampunk, uh, patchwork sort of aesthetic, right? And so, you know, I'm, uh, there's 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 a part of me that's creating through the visual language and aesthetic that just f appeals to me on the most boring, fundamental way. And 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 as black artists, we don't really get to do that a lot, right? Particularly if you're trying to be a successful artist, it's like, what is your artwork saying about this, that, and this? <laughs> when it's like, I like to, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, just paint like strips on like tape and let it dry and then see what I get out of that. You know what I mean? And it's so funny, like I talk to my other friends who are artists, we always like every year take a tally of like black artists that just do abstract art that isn't like blackness or identity. You know what I mean? So there's, there's so many layers to kind of how I think through everything that I'm doing and uh, the awareness of the responsibility that's thrust on me as architect, as black artist, right? What is the value of my work if it's not, you know, presenting some sort of critical, um, uh, uh, you know, critical thinking through of, of, of particular issues? So there's so many ways I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like disentangle all of that. Amazing, yeah, thanks for, thanks for the questions. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. So my book, um, is a lot around black celebration, black culture, and I have an interracial family. And this term of Afrofuturism is so exciting to me because it kind of gave me hope that it creates somewhat of a safe space where, where the concept of appropriation is being further pushed away. So I don't know how you relate to that. I think that, I think that it's definitely, it, it provides a safe space in, 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 in some ways, for sure. Um, and, uh, and, and a sense of belonging and a sense of reclamation, right? Um, that this is, this is created by and for us. This, this, be, this is ours, or uh, he or she is part of, uh, of us, right? So that, that's a very safe space to be in, yes. Um, one of the challenges that I have with that safe space is that it's not happening within a bubble. You know, there are many people outside of that that are going to find a way to capitalize on it, that are going to find a way to minimize it, um, that uh, will, will do things with it and contort it in ways that make it limiting. Um, and then at the end of the day, if we're not careful, then it becomes a pigeonhole. Um, it becomes something that you're lumped right into, 
um, that you may not necessarily want to be known by. It doesn't mean that you don't honor it, you don't love it, but um, you know, it's it's that conversation that that a lot of black artists have. Do I want to be known as a black artist or just an artist? Do I want to be known as a, a, a woman, a female artist, or just an artist? Do I want to be known as an Afrofuturistic artist? So, you know, it's just another label and title that we're adding to the mix of things when we haven't even yet figured out how to deal with those other aspects of, of identity uh, when it comes to uh, making, creating. And so I just think that as safe as it can be, we have to be vigilant, we have to be careful, we have to be wise um, in constantly expanding on what that safe space means and looks like and who controls that. I've got a question uh, for Providence. This is of a generalization of what, wh where those pieces come from, and and you know people say, oh no, it's, it comes from from uh, from Mali, it comes from Nigeria, it comes from. But what's being done to actually recognize the people who are behind these particular pieces? What platform is being created to celebrate the individual piece, the individual people who are producing these pieces? I mean, I 100% agree with that critique, and it was something that I realized through the process of like midway through us even curating the exhibition. And it's something that I acknowledged in the, the statement that I wrote that accompanies the exhibition that's online, it was like, oh wow, I'm guilty of the same, you know, things that I'm critiquing, right? We sort of like, African and indigenous is so broad and it's, you know, it's, it's so universalized. And, and it was like, isn't that what we're interrogating here? So I, you know, I had to, you know, but I didn't have an answer for it. And I think that it's often, um, that often is becomes like the critique levied against black Americans, especially because it is, you know, again, because that connection is so divorced. And when we try to redraw those lines, um, we often don't even know where to start, right? Because that whole legacy was erased, right? So now we're trying to piece it together. And like I was saying before, oftentimes it's clumsily done and we make mistakes along the way. but. You know, for me, that was this was kind of a starting point in reconnecting and bridging my personal identity with the work that I was creating. And no, it wasn't perfect. And that was something that I realized sort of along the way. The way that, where did we go forward? I mean, that was why we pursued the collaboration with Studio Nancy afterward, right? And it was about creating something new, as like this point was made. You know, we can't piece together all the points of history. And in many cases, the individual narratives of each one of those artworks will forever be lost. Like we don't have the provenance and we can't reinstate it, but what we can do is create something new. And so that is what Evan was seeking to do with his collection was reclaiming this broad generalized African aesthetic, right? Because that's as best as we know it and that's as best as he understood it at the moment, but then also reclaiming its influence over modernism. But ultimately it's about creating a whole new body of work that represents all of those different layers of his own personal experience and culture, right? And that work belongs to him and it will forever belong to him and that provenance will never be lost. So, I mean, that's as best as, as I can think of right now. And I, like, I'm not an art historian, so I can't you know, speak to what work could possibly be done to reinstate the legacy and provenance of you know, all of those individual artists who were completely erased. But what we hope to do is to continue with the same, building these new stories, building new narratives. I hope to, the second go around of Providence, part two will be newly commissioned works where individual artists can identify a single point of inspiration, dig deeply and produce a new body of work and speak to those references more individually. And that was not something that we did here. Um, there were time constraints and everything, but it's also just something I didn't re even think of or realize in the moment. It came, so it, again, it's a process. So I, I came to realize that as I was going through this curatorial experience and researching and learning more, and my own ignorance was revealed, so. Amazing, thanks for the, the great questions. Um, I think, yeah, let's, let's give the, you guys another round of applause, it's amazing.